All right, so I'm going to, um, I imagine that most of the audience is quite familiar with OCT, but I'm going to have a very short introduction, but I'm mostly going to speak to you about uh, polarization sensitive OCT today. So let me see if I can get my, this thing to work. And um, as Wolfgang said, I'm based in Guildford at the University of Surrey. Um, we are about 35 minutes from London. And uh, I've not been to London for more than a year. Uh, so it's, a, it's certainly a, a strange time. Um, the university sits on top of Stag Hill, uh, where the uh, King Henry's used to, uh, King Henry VIII used to go hunting uh, for stags. There's not much, uh, not many um, deer floating around on the university campus these days, but you might see the odd one. Um, and let me, as I said, begin with a whistle stop of, of OCT and literally just a few slides to introduce to anyone who hasn't heard of it before. Um, you know, it, it has had its 25th anniversary already in 2016. So goodness gracious, this means it's, uh, it's up for its 30th anniversary. Um, time is flying. Um, but in essence, we're talking about uh, a scanning method which generates two dimensional or three dimensional images by scanning a focused beam in two dimensions and, and in the third dimension producing uh, depth sectioning uh, through the optical interferometry. And uh, key to that is the use of a broadband light source with lots of frequency components such that they only add up coherently over a very narrow range of length and that produces the depth sectioning. Of course, in practice, it's not actually done in the time domain these days. It's done in the optical frequency domain with a spectrometer. Uh, and, uh, and that has proven to be an incredibly powerful technology. Um, the areas covered are vast, uh, but it is really dominated by ophthalmology. Um, but there is a lot of diversity, um, particularly uh, in medicine, uh, in, uh, in the applications of OCT. And when I last updated this slide, I think mid last year, there were something like 86,000 records. Um, and you can see that uh, it involves steady growth over a long period of time and it's not really slowing because 2020 wasn't complete at that time. So the success story really is in imaging the retina. Um, and uh, you know already these images are taken from a book published in 1996. Uh, and that remains the mainstay of the success of the technique. Um, the reason for that success was a 30 times axial improvement in resolution um, for uh, um, compared to the confocal ophthalmoscope that had been used previously. Um, that's a huge technical improvement and it really proved to be a game changer when it came to imaging the retina. But um, at the same time as OCT is great for imaging things which are quite transparent, um, it can be challenging to get enough contrast. There isn't always enough. And I like to show uh, this particular example uh, when I speak to that. Um, this shows histology of um, a lymph node which has invasive ductal carcinoma. And you can see flagged up the comparative uh, images in the OCT image on the right compared to the histology image on the left. Of course, the histology image is a five micron thick slice of tissue which has been processed and stained uh, with hematoxylin and eosin. The image on the right is a section taken from a block, from a volume of tissue. You can see that you can map the structures quite effectively, but it's very difficult to a priori identify what those structures are. Um, and that comes down to a lack of specificity, a lack of, uh, and certainly marginal uh, amount of contrast. So um, I've spent a lot of time working on what I broadly call parametric imaging um, with the objective of improving contrast in OCT imaging. And in essence, what we're doing is we're typically trading off um, the third dimension. So one of the dimensions in volume in order to present the image of a parameter. And that parameter might be attenuation, um, and that has commonly been termed as parametric imaging, but it might also be uh, vasculature uh, through speckle dynamics. And in that case, we're looking at maximum intensity projections. It's still a trade-off. 
Um, birefringence is going to be the talk that I'm going to focus on today with polarization sensitive OCT, where cumulative retardance is the basic measure. And response to force uh, in elastography, it's common to measure the rate of change of, of strain uh, or of displacement versus depth to give local strain, as you probably have just heard about earlier today. So in essence, all of these methods, one way or another, are collapsing some of the three-dimensional information down to a two-dimensional image of the parameter of interest. Um, but that actual trade-off isn't actually a hard one, and so you can retrieve it. And so it's not completely uh, black and white that you're going from 3D to 2D here. You tend to have some form of axial averaging, but that could be quite small, but it's certainly opportunity for research in a number of these methods. And that's certainly the case in polarization sensitive OCT. So let's just remind ourselves what we're doing. We're actually measuring uh, the, uh, the difference uh, in, in group or in phase velocity, I should say, uh, between light waves that are propagating uh, with orthogonal polarizations through a medium which exhibits birefringence. Uh, and that then leads to either um, uh, the birefringence delta N or it leads to retardance delta phi, which is a, a, a cumulative measure of that phase shift. Um, it probes typically fibrous structures um, form uh, uh, birefringence, uh, which exists in collagen, in muscle, in nerve, a range of soft tissue structures. Um, but it's a sub It's important to note it's a sub wavelength contrast. It actually uh, exists uh, well sub resolution of the imaging system. So it's an intrinsic, almost molecular level contrast. Um, and it's important to remember that the retardance that we're measuring, the delta phi uh, represents a differential measurement. It's a cumulative measurement. So that straight away presents a challenge for how to map that to a local region in, in the depth dimension. And it's orientation dependent. Uh, if that light wave that you can see incident on the side of that fiber bundle was incident on the end face of the fiber bundle, you wouldn't see any birefringence. And so it's very important to remember that orientational element. I like to show this slide because it shows the exceptional contrast that you can achieve with, with birefringence. Um, this is, a, 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 again, a histological section, an OCT intensity and a PSOCT image of, um, of, of a piece of damaged uh, muscle. The necrosis on the left um, is contrasted against the undamaged muscle on the right. In the OCT image, you really can't see the contrast very well, but in the birefringence image, you can see it dramatically. Yes, I've certainly used a color scale that helps to accentuate that, but the difference is quite strong and it's uh, readily detectable. So if we just um, consider very briefly the prehistory of, um, of polarization sensitive OCT, I'll just show, show you three papers uh, from my favorite collection of all, all time um, polarization based papers. The first one is from Alan Rogers actually, who is a colleague who lived up the road, who's no, no longer with us unfortunately, but uh, he did polarization OTD um, OTDR, optical time domain reflectometry, back in the early 1980s. Uh, and, uh, and that method is actually still a research topic uh, to this day. Um, we then, to get to an OCDR, optical coherence domain reflectometry, we had to wait another six years. And that was then put forward by a number of groups in 1987. But of course, again, still one dimensional in an optical fiber. Um, the actual first publication on birefringence uh, sensitive ranging was, was again by the, uh, the instigators um, of, of the seminal science paper, um, Jim Fujimoto and Eric Swanson, um, with a paper was, which was actually submitted after their science paper had been submitted. So they're sort of almost backtracking, but that was the first uh, example in, in our field, as it were, of this uh, polarization dimension. Uh, and uh, it does look rather familiar to, uh, to where we ended up uh, with our instrumentation today. But we had to wait until 1997 to see what we might regard as uh, OCT uh, done with polarization sensitivity. And that was the work um, by Johannes de Boer uh, at the University of California, Irvine. And you see those images on the left are actually cumulative retardance images, which color code phase. And so you see the, uh, the cycling of two pi or sorry, of pi as you go through the, um, 
as you go through those images. So post-1997, there was actually a very long uh, gestation. Um, uh, there were a lot of issues to overcome. I think there was there's a difficult there is an intrinsic difficulty in interpreting cross-sectional cumulative retardance. Seeing fringes overlaid on structural images is, is hard to interpret. Um, we also need a higher signal to noise ratio um, than, than uh, for conventional OCT to be able to see the data. So often PSOCT images were noisier and were less clear um, than their OCT equivalent. And, and it's fair to say that the availability of effective hardware and methods, especially um, methods in fiber um, were limited. Um, and, and that was really, uh, I think, changed um, by the availability of volumetric imaging that brought to the possibility of having an on fast interpretation, even if you weren't able to actually section, you could still see uh, structures in the other dimension, which has proven to be enormously uh, helpful. Uh, we then developed the swept sourced um, methodologies and, uh, and the capacity to time delay polarization multiplex. I'll show you that in a moment. And finally, we developed techniques to be able to depth resolve the local birefringence. And I'm going to talk today about the next step on that, which is the depth resolve local optic axis. So I personally feel quite upbeat that um, despite the fact that PSOCT is technically demanding, that there's lots of opportunity for it going forwards. And I hope to uh, reinforce that in my talk today. So um, I'm just quickly going to show you some contemporary instrumentation, um, very briefly touch on how we actually extract the local birefringence. Um, and, uh, and point out that this, this can now actually be reliably done through catheters, which I think is a, a, another game changer, which has taken a long time uh, to, uh, to, to develop. So here is a swept source OCT system. And you can see, I think you can see my mouse there. Um, and uh, you can see this polarization delay unit and this polarization diverse detection. These are the key things. So we generate time delayed S and P states in the polarization delay unit, and then we detect them with polarization diverse detection generating an H and a V channel. And so we end up with the four elements of, of, of a Jones matrix. Uh, and in this case, captured in a single shot, which is rather beautiful. Not the only way to do it, but certainly an attractive and powerful way to do it. And so this uh, Jones matrix that we capture essentially involves the cumulative Jones matrices of the input uh, light beam uh, of the sample itself, the sample in, uh, in backscattering, and then the outward path. Uh, and so we've got to somehow try to figure out how to extract uh, not only uh, the Jones matrix of the sample, but then the depth resolved Jones matrix uh, at a particular location. So I don't propose to go through uh, the mathematics of that um, in any depth at all today, but just to indicate that uh, the first thing to do is to recognize that the round trip uh, is symmetric. And so you, if you, you are able to do a number of um, non-ideal instrument uh, transfer function uh, performances, they can be recovered by recognizing that there must be symmetry. Uh, we also need to remove any equivalent dispersion uh, in the polarization domain, so polarization mode dispersion, uh, and, and finally um, actually reconstruct uh, a complete uh, round trip um, um, Mueller matrix in this case for the purposes of spatially averaging. I'll touch on Mueller versus Jones matrices on the next slide and ultimately then calculate uh, the depth resolved version uh, of that signal uh, giving us uh, eventually a retardance, which is which is localized. Now, as I said, um, you can actually use Jones vectors or Stokes parameters uh, in this case because you're dealing with a coherent process. So I'm dealing with the mixing of a sample and a reference, and so um, either calculus uh, can can be used. Uh, and uh, there are subtle differences. In the previous slide, I referred to using. Uh, um, Mueller matrices, and that was specifically to eliminate phase sensitivity uh, in order to average over speckle, which is helpful in some cases, but not always necessary. So ultimately, what we're looking for is, as I said, the depth resolved um, uh, retardance and local optic axis, and we extract. So we're interested in extracting this little number two uh, located down here from this uh, collective signal. Uh, and we do that through an iterative process 
that starts at the surface and gradually works its way down at each uh, location, calculating this incremental value, uh, following a method that was first uh, championed by Fan and Yao uh, in uh, 2013. And when we do that, uh, we find that not only can we measure the, uh, the, the birefringence uh, as shown in this plot here, but we can also then extract the local optic axis. So the color here refers to orientation. Uh, and you can see from the little animation that we can also do that in depth, which of course is the, uh, was the prime objective. Um, this is just strips of plastic that exhibit birefringence. It's a phantom for polarization sensitive OCT. So then we're able to generate uh, things of the type that are shown here. So this is now, again, the cross section in depth. Uh, and this slide really just highlights the, um, the difference that you get between local retardance and local optic axis versus their cumulative equivalence. Very difficult to map the cumulative equivalence back to anything that you might see in the sample. And I'll, I'll show you other examples of this where perhaps that might be a little clearer. Um, but um, certainly being able to calculate these local parameters has proven to be absolutely vital. So in the rest of this talk, I'm going to um, cover um, uh, a whole lot of examples. And so we'll go through the examples at a reasonable pace because I think you're going to get a bit sick of um, all the colourful uh, little squiggles at some point. But I'll hopefully I will bring out for you what's important uh, along that journey. So first of all, in, in oral tissue, um, we're interested in cancer, and I'm not going to show you any cancer today, but the point is that actually cancer uh, has a cellular component, but it also has a stromal component. So we're interested in this case, looking at the fibrous tissues and, and how they vary uh, in the oral cavity, and can we detect them, and then can we potentially detect their disruption. So this just shows uh, an, an image, again, um, of the local birefringence at a particular depth in the lip. You can see the location of imaging and you see this lovely uh, patchwork structure here, this sort of quilt structure that you can see coming from a depth that is highlighted by these purple arrows. Uh, and you can see that that's quite hard to see in the intensity image and quite confusing and blurred uh, in the cumulative retardance image. Uh, certainly in B scan, very difficult to interpret. Um, so that demonstrates the collagen architecture that we can see at the appropriate depth in that oral tissue captured in, in vivo. So we did some little some work on color coding this. Um, you can see as you step through the bands shown in that little yellow block um, that they uh, that they reveal quite nicely the different structures. We started playing around with how to present that in some form of uh, clinically uh, quickly accessible form. And again, that just tends to, to highlight the structures uh, and how clear they are. Uh, if we look elsewhere in the, in the normal oral mucosa, you can start to see other structures. So this is on the dorsal tongue and the transition uh, in the tongue from dorsal to lateral. And in these cases, I think you can see that the, uh, the OCT intensity images actually display greater um, um, contrast uh, than in the previous images. But nonetheless, the local birefringence images are very, very strongly contrasted and you can uh, perform the same type of depth color coding um, to bring out particular features uh, there. Um, this just shows the same thing, but now flying through the whole of the uh, millimeter uh, or so of image. So you start from the, uh, from the surface, the cellular surface and work your way into the fibrous tissues. This just gives you a sense of the quality of data that you can generate over a whole millimeter. Again, local birefringence in black and white and local optic axis here. Uh, but you really start to bring out this sort of patchwork pattern that you can see um, in, the, uh, in the collagenous structures that exist uh, within that lower lip. So I want to show you another cancer example, and that's um, uh, via a needle. And uh, um, as uh, Wolfgang mentioned, that that was work that we did some considerable time ago and is uh, still undergoing or still is, is now a technology developed uh, by a company in Adelaide. Um, we, um, we, we actually developed these quite high performance imaging needle probes. And this just shows the OCT image of a, of a fingertip um, um, when you put your fingers around the needle 
and uh, we showed that, you know, these images of this is a translucent structure, like uh, it's actually a, a, a cucumber, so it's membranous, but largely transparent. It showed that we could generate images as good in the needle-based systems as we could in OCT systems. So we started to put these to work, and this was some work that was um, quite highly acclaimed at the time, um, which demonstrated that uh, in a uh, freshly excised sample of a breast tumour, this is an ultrasound probe on top, um, that you could actually extract from your 3D uh, recorded volume uh, this nice differentiation between tumour and the rest of the sample. Um, but the challenge of this particular uh, example is that it's very easy to tell the difference between adipose and, and, and other tissue, dense tissue. Um, but it's very hard to tell the difference between tumour and stroma. And certainly here, you can't really tell the difference between tumour and stroma, except from an architectural standpoint. Um, so the next step is to go to looking at birefringence. And so we did this work, which again, these, these, these are needle images. Uh, and so these are sections taken from the needle images matched to accompanying histology. So of course the histology, you've got to take the sample away, you've got to process it, you end up with a five micron thick section under a microscope stained with hematoxylin and ES. And very difficult to do that um, uh, work after you've actually recorded uh, these, in vitro, these, these uh, fresh ex vivo images. So again, in this case, OCT images, very little um, differentiation within the stromal tissues, within the fibrous tissues, and they all look the same. You can certainly see the adipose tissues, they're the, they're the sort of dark light ones, but you can't see the rest. On the other hand, you can see in these local birefringence images, you can really start to see that you are getting contrast between tumour and stroma. And so you see the tumour is typically lower birefringence, it's yellow. Uh, as opposed to being uh, pinky purple. Uh, and that's because tumour is, is, tends to be disrupted and its fibrous structures tend to be somewhat scrambled relative to the ordered fibrous structures in normal stroma. And so I think it's a nice example of generating contrast. And uh, if you've seen uh, the talk from Brendan Kennedy, then you would have seen elastography as another interesting way to generate similar contrast, a difference between stroma and, and tumour. The next example I want to touch on is um, local birefringence uh, of airway smooth muscle. Um, and this is uh, work that needs to be done through a catheter in order to probe um, uh, airways in vivo uh, for the study of asthma and other respiratory diseases. Um, here is uh, what histology looks like in um, uh, for normal and asthmatic tissues. And this is the airway smooth muscle around here, this uh, dark pink. And uh, you can see that in, in asthmatic patients, it's much more dominant and, and prominent. It tends to thicken um, uh, with, uh, with the development of, of asthma. And it's not possible to image it in vivo um, uh, any way at the moment, other than potentially this one. And uh, I think the, this is very promising. And this is uh, uh, work which has been uh, championed um, by Melissa Suter's group in Boston. But this is some of our early work on this. Uh, this shows a portion of a sheep airway. Um, and so the, the airway is a, is a tubular structure. Um, and so we've taken a section of that and you can see the inside of the tube on the top and the outside of the tube on the bottom. And uh, sure enough, in the OCT images, you can see these dark portions of cartilage and the epithelial tissue at the surface, much brighter. But if you look at the uh, optic axis images, you can see this airway smooth muscle very clearly illuminated uh, throughout that tissue structure. Um, and you see that in multiple samples. You can see it uh, um, uh, very, very clearly. And so it's a very powerful way to enhance the contrast of airway smooth muscle uh, in, in an airway tissue. And we have done that in, uh, in a number of other uh, samples and we've started to, to look at human cadaver samples as well. There's a lot of work ongoing back in Western Australia on this topic. And, uh, and this just shows uh, again, the airway smooth muscle in green, uh, very nicely highlighted um, in, this, uh, in this particular sample. So um, I did want to talk to you a little bit about recent work we've been doing on skin. Uh, skin's a much more confusing picture, but uh, let's take a look at um, what some of these uh, images look like um, in normal skin. So again, we're presenting cumulative optic axis here in the middle and local optic axis on the right. 
uh, and you've got the intensity image on the left. You can see a little bit of artifact in the intensity image. There's some um, air bubbles uh, under the, the glass uh, slide that was used to provide ind index matching at the surface. Um, but you can't see much in the cumulative optic axis. It's confusing. You see much more in the local optic axis. And you start to begin to see fibre structures and how fibres orientate around dermal papillae uh, within, within the normal skin. Um, much more powerful than the than the cumulative images. And I think to some degree complementary with the intensity images. Of course, you've always got the intensity image. It's not something that you have to go after. It's already there. And let me show you these ones, which are just uh, images from the forearm. Um, they're again, just demonstrating the very different uh, collagenous fibrous architectures that the skin has in, in different locations. Of course, we know that skin has um, has lines of order and um, according to how elastic it is meant to be along different axes. And I think you start to pick out some of this uh, in, in this imaging. So we've also done some imaging at much higher resolution. And um, I, I'm just going to, I, I can't see any time here. What time am I first supposed to finish Wolfgang? Oh, I can't hear you're on mute. But just, just go ahead, go ahead. Take your time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I've probably got about 10 minutes to go. Is that is that okay? All right, very good. So, thank you. So um, this is another type of instrument uh, which um, performs optical coherence microscopy. It's, it's really a variant of, of OCT, um, but it achieves much higher resolution. And so the resolution achieved is uh, 1.4 microns axial, 1.6 microns transverse, it uses a continu super continuum source, so it's a very broadband source, uh, and it uses twin uh, spectrometers to detect one for each polarization state, and it, it uses a serial polarization multiplexing. So now we have uh, um, sequentially uh, odd and even um, polarization states as the modulator switches. Uh, and it combines that with the Bessel beam uh, illumination and a Gaussian beam detection framework. Um, to extend that, uh, that depth of focus uh, over a range which is um, larger than it would be if it was just simply Gaussian beam, enabling us to get you know, quite, quite high resolution over hundreds of microns uh, in an image, much larger than what you might anticipate by reading illumination depth of field 75 microns, but you be the judge. Um, so what was interesting, first of all, with this was that we were able to compare and contrast uh, the, the two instruments, uh, one with, um, with around the sub two micron resolution, the other at about the 10 micron, a little bit over 10 microns. Um, and so you can start to see just what the OCT images look like in intensity and how much more you can see when you actually go to this high resolution, of course, how much less deep you can see. Um, and then you can also look at the optic axis uh, um, uh, and then the filtered optic axis when you actually make it look like the resolution of the other one and start to make these side-by-side -side comparisons. There is actually a pretty good level of consistency across resolution, which is uh, sort of surprising. I don't think we've got the last word on that, but it's certainly interesting to start to look at these sorts of comparisons. And, and here we see uh, another one, again, at these two different resolutions. So we've got the high resolution work on the left here, the low resolution on the right. I mean, it, it looks like these images are just blurred, but it's just because they are actually at 11 microns resolution. Um, then we have the optic axis orientations again, and then we can compare the two uh, when we, blur, we deliberately blur the high resolution one to match the resolution of the, low re of the low resolution one. And we see quite reasonable comparison, although we do see some contrast between the two you can do the comparison for yourself. Um, it's, uh, if you'd like to read more, that paper was um, published in Optics Letters. So it's a short read. You'd be able to do that over your coffee. Um, so um, we've only done the high resolution work uh, for the cornea, but I think it's very interesting to look at that. This is the last uh, uh, subject, I'm, or the last uh, imaging target I'm gonna show you. Um, again, uh, this is the imaging uh, in the corneal limbus region. Um, and this just shows the uh, local optic axis orientation, which we really start to begin to pick out the layers of the cornea, which are very, very thin. Um, where these images are taken uh, in this sort of uh, transition region here, and you can actually see the transition taking place 
uh, in this central region in the image. This is in the fast scanning axis, um, and this is in the slow scanning axis. So you see, see quite similar fiber structures, um, and you tend to see, you might be able to see these sort of uh, angled structures here. I'll come back to those in a moment. Always better to look at the video. So here's the, here's the moving images as we scan through uh, that junction. Uh, and again, you see this sort of uh, simultaneously, you see the layers very exquisitely exercised in the bottom part of the figure. And you see these uh, other vertical structures in the top part of the figure. Um, of course, those uh, vertical uh, sort of angled structures are simply those that were drawn by William Bowman in 1847. Um, in, uh, in, 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 in his early work and identifying exactly what they are. So if I show you that again, you can now see those, um, those, those anchoring structures that stabilize the, uh, um, the layers uh, within the cornea. But you see uh, in the OCT image, then you see that lovely morphology, but in the uh, optic axis image, you really start to see the orientation of the layers. And uh, because we have 1.5 or 1.6 micron resolution here, you are actually able to see within a layer. Um, this is now imaging a cornea from the bottom. So again, a little bit more ordered and the layers are very close together. Uh, this uh, is a cellular layer at the surface there. And you see that sort of a bit uh, salt and pepper because there is no uh, actual consistent layering there. Uh, and um, if you keep, uh, uh, oh, I should never start going back. Yeah, and uh, and you can al almost uh, see the cells, the bright, the bright shiny, uh, the the brighter points there. Uh, almost see the, the the cellular structures that exist uh, in that, uh, uh, that that very bottom portion, uh, close to decimates uh, membrane. Um, Remember, we're imaging it upside down. Okay, um, I'm going to recap at that point. Um, to say that uh, I think the thing about polarization phenomena is that they are intrinsically rather attractive. Um, it, they're, they're beautifully complicated, um, but, but they uh, demonstrate, I think, uh, wonderful uh, natural uh, beauty and elegance. Um, I think the methods for PSOCT have nearly matured. Um, I think they are complicated, but they're getting more accessible uh, all the time. Um, I think you know it's fascinating to think that the contrast mechanism is actually well sub-resolution. It's almost at the molecular level. Um, of course, you can only present that with uh, optical resolution. Um, but I think overall, uh, exploring the use of polarization-sensitive OCT hasn't uh, in any way completed, and uh, I think the field has a bright future. So I'm going to just uh, finish by saying that my embryonic group at Surrey uh, contains some exceptionally small members. Um, who have got a lot to learn, um, um, and, uh, but there's more to come. Um, I also wanted to particularly note that much of the work that I've presented, particularly the recent work, was done in collaboration with Martin Villiger, uh, who is uh, at the Harvard Medical School. And uh, it was uh, the, the, the man on the bench was uh, Chingyun Lee, who's a, a very gifted PhD student now working um, uh, in a startup company uh, in, uh, in Melbourne with another one of my um, former postdocs, Dirk Lorenza. Uh, and I'd also like to acknowledge Julia Volta for the work in the oral cavity, which was um, very, very nice work while she was visiting uh, us a couple of years ago in Western Australia. So with that, uh, let me uh, stop and um, hand back to Wolfgang.